Performance Plus presents the Summit Club Podcast, your business roundtable discussion for sales and business leaders with your host, Bill Stats. Today, we'll be discussing how to create competitive advantage in your organization. Based on a recent white paper and the book Competitive Advantage by Brian Tracy and Fred Wurzma, let's take a look at the three pillars of competitive advantage. Also, there's a white paper that's out. It's entitled Competitive Advantage, and it's got a foreword by Jack Welsh where, quote, if you don't have competitive advantage, don't compete. And to me, what he's really trying to say is it's easier to be a jack of all than it is to be a master of nothing. Come on. They're both the same thing. What we need to be is a master of something. So with that being said, think about your organization. We're going to take you through the three value disciplines. And keep in mind that if you and your leadership team and your organization are serious about using the assets your company has wisely and effectively in your marketplace, your team has to choose your customers carefully. And they have to present a value that you intend to create for them. And then the entire organization has to be behind delivering that value to the customer. Let's start with the first value discipline, operational excellence. Efficiency, costs have been wrung out of it. It's a good quality product, good value, no extras, no extravagant add-ons. Second discipline, product leadership. That's all about innovation developing and growing something that didn't exist before. The last pillar of value discipline, customer intimacy. It's building a relationship, friendship, if you will, with your customer to create a competitive advantage. So let's take them one by one. We'll have our team at the Business Roundtable talk a little bit about some examples that they think fit that particular discipline. And our goal today is to give you an overview of the whole value discipline concept and set you up with enough information that you'll be able to explore future podcasts that will deal with each one of these value disciplines individually. So I'll ask the question to the team around the round table. What is operational excellence? Where there's incredible efficiency, lots of effort in performing at the lowest cost possible and still providing a great product or service. What do you think? Well, um, to me, the the first company that jumps to my mind is is Amazon. I mean, I think uh, they excel in operational excellence. They they do this as well, if not better than anybody. Um, You buy something for Amazon, it gets to you very, very quickly. If there's any kind of holdup, they let you know. Returning things is incredibly easy and uh, just about anything you want you can get on Amazon. It's interesting. You know, if you if, if you roll back retail a number of years, Walmart would have been considered, uh, and still is considered, a leader in operational excellence. They took a little bit different strategy, how they partnered with their vendors, how they, they moved the entire model, if you will, of inventory. Their inventory demands are so much less than any other retailer based on their planning, and most of their planning is actually done by their suppliers. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I think one of the things we have to keep in mind, they're all not what I would describe as commodity businesses. I mean, it seems like they have a broad range of elements of service, but it's not, I don't know if you're going to buy a dump truck on Amazon or... I mean, I'm sure there are things that, that, that they choose not to do, but what they choose to do if you think about UPS, um, they do it well, yeah. and typically uh, they're companies with lots of resource, deep pockets. Why? It takes a lot to create and manage the top logistics organization on the planet, like Amazon. You see what Amazon's doing with robotics. To them, the trade-off is worth it investing in robotics to reduce their costs. It's not uh, a storefront on Main Street that's probably going to be doing that. What else can we think about as far as operational excellence? Usually the kind of companies that this pertains to 
has a lot of competitors. There's many people in that market, which by definition is going to force it that if you're going to play in this space, you have to be the better, cheaper, faster. And where operational excellence comes into play for your organization, many of these companies have set up operations internally to help them achieve that. It's not just work harder, work harder, it's working smarter to work harder. And Bill, you mentioned earlier um, something about UPS having their own GPS. Yeah, they have their own traffic, they bought a traffic service just so they could eliminate left turns. It's crazy, but I don't know how many trucks they have out there. If you multiply every one of those trucks on a route with no left turns, the time savings is incredible. The traffic, because they're not waiting to fit, fit into the flow of traffic. Hmm. It's the same with uh, same concept with Walmart. They bought a weather service. Why? Because if it snows in Tucson, their business model says they better have snow sho shovels up on the shelf and they want to know before anybody else. I know a driver, uh, a friend of mine's son who works for UPS, and I asked him about that. And I said, mm -hmm. Dude, you don't really, you don't really do that, right? And he went, no, absolutely we yeah. do that. And they know if we're not doing it. <laughs> wow. Um, and because it saves them time. Sure. It saves them time. And they figured it out, so good for them. So let's jump a little bit and take a look at product leadership. That's the second value discipline. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about what it means to be, as we are portraying Summit Club podcast, on the, getting you to the top of the mountain. These are folks that when it comes to innovation and uh, doing what nobody had ever done before, they're at the top of the mountain. Guys, can you think of some examples of companies that fit this particular value discipline? Uh, there, I don't think there's any better example in my mind than a company like Apple, and Steve, Steve sure. Jobs. I mean, what he was able to do, um, you know, if, if you read anything about him, he was fanatical about every detail. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the nice things for me, because I'm a, uh, you know, an idiot in trying to work any of these kinds of devices, is it's anything I ever did on an Apple product is just intuitive. You'd sit there and you go, well, I don't know, but I would think it probably works like this, and more often than not, it does work like mm -hmm. that. So um, he was an innovator and um, built a great company, and I think an excellent example of product leadership. You know, it's interesting with Apple, so many companies go out into the marketplace and ask their customer what they want. Apple did it, you know, completely the opposite way. They created products that they determined that's customers want. wanted that they did. The customer had no idea what the product was. They've changed how we listen to music. They've changed so many things in our life because they have products that have led entire groups of people into new ways of doing things. Right. Yeah. You, you know, it's funny when you mention that. I can remember many years ago when Macintosh came out. I don't remember if it was the first, the last, whatever, but I remember Charlie, a friend of mine, showing me his. Macintosh, and it had what he called a mouse, and the screen was all pictures. I'm used to DOS and whatever the rest of the world was doing, trying to figure it all out. And here all you do is touch a button on the mouse on a picture, and it's like, to Rick's point, sometimes it's so easy that you can't believe it, and you're used to doing complicated things, like Microsoft. Now, one of the ideas with Apple, with product leadership, isn't necessarily always coming up with the brand new widget. It's sometimes taking the existing widget and bringing it to the masses where it can be. It makes sense. For instance, um, I think it was mid '90s or early '90s, let's say, where you had um, personal computing was more of this a like, geek culture, where you had like the big clunky box with the big clunky monitor and all this gear and all these wires. And then you might have to Google this for some of you younger people out there. Is the um, the original IMAX? And they had Jeff Goldblum with this revolutionary, revolutionary ad campaign, revolutionary product. And the whole idea was at that ad campaign, you can buy this, take it out of the box. It's up and running within five minutes. And they showed it to you on the ad. Done. So you have millions and millions of people that thought, oh, I'm not going to buy a computer because they're used to the IBM culture of I got these wires. What is a seat prompt and all this? Or I can just buy this product. And they did, Apple took the whole personal computing space and made it plug and play. Done. And that was like pouring fire on the gasoline for them. And at the same time, 
John, to your point with the uh, the uh, listening to your music, they came out with the iPod at that point. Poor iPod's been retired in the, in the past couple months, unfortunately. Rest in peace. But they completely revolutionized, revolutionized that industry. People before that, you know, they had their CDs and they're having yeah. the, the, the CD cases and all that fun stuff. And, you know, they're bringing that into their car. What am I going to put in? Well, here comes the iPad. Apple decided, you know what? We're going to take this existing way of working and completely not, we're going to, you're going to do it this way instead. And then again, it revolutionized an entire industry. And we couldn't even believe how small it was. The original yeah. iPod was just like this little thing. <laughs> and it held all this music and everything. And it was like crazy. I think it's interesting to John's point. I mean, uh, all respect to consumers. Sometimes they don't know what they want until they mm -hmm. actually see it. I spent a number of years in the broadcast business. And if you're changing the format of a radio station, you sit down with focus groups and you say to them, hey, would you listen to a radio station like this? You know, more often than not, they would go, yeah. But the problem there is until they actually hear it in their ears and can interpret it, it, it really, really has no meaning. So you can do research to get and look at opportunities, but some, at some point you have to go, okay, this makes sense to us, we're going to do it, and then let the, the consumers and customers react after they actually see the product. Interesting. You know, another company that, that leaps to mind when it comes to product leadership is Tesla. You bet. I mean, mm -hmm. well, I mean Tesla has changed the automobile industry in such a way. I mean, companies that have been around for a hundred years now are talking about going all electric in right. the next two to three years. Yep. And just recently read a great article uh, in the Wall Street Journal, and they talked about the future of the automobile industry. This was because of Tesla. In the future, will people be buying automobiles from traditional automobile companies that we know, mm -hmm. or we, will we be buying our automobiles from technology companies? Mm -hmm. that's, that's where it's all going anyway with the way this is there's there's more tech than it used to be four gauges of a stick shift and, and pedals now it's like NASA when you get into your car there's yeah. all the you know there's the touch screens and everything else yeah. in, in play it parks itself it can drive itself Marriott's another example you know there were no such thing as business we'd call it a club or a group or an association or a membership concept in the hotel business until Marriott came along and all of a sudden you have access to different perks at the hotel you get points nobody had ever really done anything like that before how about Disney just think of what Disney did to before Disney the entertainment thing looked like the ice capades and the circus mm -hmm. right yeah, yeah so if we take a look at the kind of company that would focus on or qualify for a value discipline of product leadership. What are we thinking? Guys, what? I think it's more of a high risk proposition because you're really putting yourself and your company out there deciding this is what your customer needs to buy even if they don't realize they need to buy that yet. So it's uh, you really need to have your A game on in order to play in that space or just be, pre be prepared to have a fall in case that great big idea isn't really that great after all. It also, to me, um, you got to be comfortable being first because everybody's going to take a shot at you. And all of a sudden, you just think of all the different products that someone came out with that didn't exist before, and you've got all kinds of foreign uh, <laughs> competitors uh, duplicating or trying to duplicate what you did, and in many cases, without the quality they kind of almost create turbulence or static in the marketplace. So you gotta be ready for that. You, you also have to be a real innovator. Uh, and, and I think this would, would be, in my mind, one of the value disciplines that really, really isn't for everybody. Sure. I mean, not everybody is an innovator. You look at what Tesla did and what Apple did. Um, it, it's Again, it's just not for all of us. I mean, even with uh, the Tesla space, there was, I think it was Fisker, that was that was one of the other original ones. I think mm -hmm. they actually came a little bit before Tesla. Yeah, and they just didn't have the momentum or the buckets. resources. Yeah, they just poured buckets of money into it, and it was awesome. They had a couple cool projects out there, and failed. It's funny you mention that because they've reincarnated themselves yeah, under Karma. I don't know whose money is behind them, but I was behind a Karma yesterday, and I couldn't figure out at a distance. It kind of looked like a, the back of a new Corvette, but it kind of didn't. And when I pulled up behind it, sure enough, it's got 
a karma logo that's not real recognizable and on the right rear part of the trunk it says karma and it's beautiful but wow it i, I it destroyed the first one just trying to build it <laughs> well so much of this category has to do with confidence product knowledge and timing yes you bet so why don't we take a look at uh, that third discipline, if you will, or pillar of uh, this idea around value discipline and competitive advantage. And this one is customer intimacy. Uh, relationship is really the key element in building around the value proposition of customer intimacy. Examples. What are we thinking, uh, folks, about examples of customer intimacy where the relationship is not just the goal, it's the lifeblood of that value concept? Well, for, for those of us, that I think, that ever been to a Trader Joe's, I mean, the employees there are the happiest people in the world. Uh, they, they cannot be more helpful when you walk in. I mean, I, uh, after spending maybe a lot of money there, I always leave the store with a smile. Uh, it, it's just uh, they just figured it out, and uh, you know this kind of these kind of things is they don't take a lot of money necessarily. It's just hiring the right people and teaching them the right discipline. So in, in my mind, uh, this is certainly a value discipline that you can get into fairly easily, uh, and something you could also excel at. You know what's interesting about you bring that up? You know I don't know that much about uh, the food sales business, supermarkets, retail, except that I'm always told or I always read that the margins are very thin. Right. And you mentioned Trader, Trader Joe's. What about Wegmans? Here, here's another company that everybody's happy. Everybody loves their job. Yeah. It, the store inside is unbelievable. It's got a cafe. It's got a bar. It's got, it sells liquor, wine, beer. And yet the pricing is pretty typical and competitive mm -hmm. with everybody else. Yeah. So ha they built an incredible relationship yeah. with their... Yeah. Well, that's a consumer. company when you uh, look at the list of companies, best companies <clears throat> in America to work for, that's always on it. <clears throat> you know, and I think if you look at that list, you're going to find a lot of people that are really, really good in this value discipline. I think it's interesting that when one op Wegmans opened near us, my wife and I went on a Saturday night. Don't ask me why, but we... We had dinner, nice dinner. You wait there. Yeah. Had a few drinks. Right, I thought of that. And then went never grocery did. shopping. I mean, it's like I've never done that before. Well, you went on a Saturday night because you have no life. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, what's interesting, when we talk about Wegmans and Trader Joe's, this is not innovative product. These are commodities. You know? So here you can take a commodity that people can find in any community in, in, in the United States and their customer service is what separates them from all their competition. So, you know, it's it's not about doing anything other than knowing your customer, caring about your customer, and providing super service to your customer. That's really it, I think. It, it comes down to building that relationship, though, like you said, and you wanna have, you wanna feel like you are friends, practically, with the people that work at that establishment, even down to, Simple things. You go to a place to get your hair cut. There's the people that they know you all the time, or the bar that you go to that they know you. You sit sit down at the bar. There's your drink. You don't have to ask for it. It's that that intimacy where you just feel comfortable in the the shopping experience. We'll call it. So whether you're you're going to the grocery store or you're buying a car, you're getting a haircut, uh, or even talking to any kind of consultative agency out there. Whether it's an interior decorator. Um, sales training or even a graphic design marketing company. If you don't have the relationship with them outside of the product, of course, chances are it's going to get stale pretty quickly and you'll find yourself spending your dollars elsewhere. Well, one of the things that we really will try to focus on in subsequent podcasts that support this overview, there are key indicators where you're able to get a feel for where your company plays or doesn't play relative to what your leadership team considers as your value discipline. And 
we'll be glad to talk about it again in future podcasts specifically. But if you have a relationship with a customer and your point of contact is purchasing, there's a really good chance that there's a signal being sent to you that it's not very intimate. Purchasing people are disciplined and in some cases forbidden to create personal relationships with sources and uh, sourcing and procurement. If you have a relationship where your point of contact, whether it's a sales rep, whatever, is connected to many departments and many people, there's a good indication that there's a strength of relationship there that qualifies you for customer intimacy. So with that being said, the next three podcasts will be going into detail about each one of these value disciplines, operational excellence, product leadership, and customer intimacy. Don't forget, the economy-minded buyer who wants to pay as little as possible for good quality goods and services is an operational excellence value discipline company. The customer who's willing to pay a premium for leading edge, cutting edge, bleeding edge product or service is product leadership. And the customer will, who will pay well for highly tailored, complex solutions to their problems, but they don't need the latest and greatest. They just need what they have to have to deliver their product or service the best way they can. And that was customer intimacy. Now, going forward, remember, it's a long climb. Sometimes it's a hard climb. We're there for you every step of the way, and we'll see you on top. Till next time. Stay tuned. Don't forget to subscribe. If you have questions, go to our website. You can drop us a line. If we read your question your topic on the show, you'll get a free t-shirt. See you next time. To learn more about the Summit Club podcast, please find us online at www.summitclubpodcast.com. The Summit Club podcast is recorded and produced by Inertia Marketing and Design, a full-service marketing, digital, and graphic communications agency. You can find them at www.inertia.marketing. Thanks for listening to the Summit Club podcast, and we'll see you at the top.